Thank you so much, Alana, Karen, and Lisa. Alana just started flute in January, so she's doing a wonderful job. Thank you, Alana, for sharing this morning. Um, good morning. Welcome to Western Springs Baptist Church. It's good to be get together to proclaim Christ as our Lord and his Savior and his King. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and always and forever. So let's stand and sing about our Christ this morning.
we come to proclaim Christ. Christ is the same from beginning to end, from Alpha to Omega. This is our Christ we serve. This is the Christ we worship. So let's come before joy, before Christ this morning. Infinite, self-existent, before the end, before beginning. Eternal One, Creator God, You made the world and it was good. All in all, self-sufficient, so high above, but never distant. Made for Your love, passion from dust, You gave us breath. And it was good. All glory and all blessing and all because your name from all is worthy for them. The praise is Good morning. Just a couple things for you to have on your attention radar. Um, today is Picnic Sunday, so I hope that you are planning and prepared to, uh, to meet us over at Denning Park, right across the street from the south campus of LT, um, shortly after the service. There's no real set time, I don't think. Um, so just make your way there. Um, and there's going to be plenty of food. We have water. We have food. Um, you just need to bring a chair or a blanket or whatever you prefer to sit on. Um, and then if you have a preferred drink of choice, you can bring that to you other than water. Um, but uh, we'd love to have you come and be a part of the picnic and spend the afternoon there. Um, it should be a glorious, warm summer day. 
right? Yep. Uh, secondly, um, this is new. Uh, our search committee has finished their first phase of putting together all the documents ready to, um, to look for um, God's leading in bringing our next senior pastor here to Western Springs Baptist Church. And uh, next Sunday, following the service, our search committee wants us all to join them up in the fireside room, and they'll just kind of refresh us through uh, the steps that they have taken and the steps that they will continue to take in the search process, and then have a dedicated time of prayer together. So put that on your calendar next Sunday following the service at 11.30, and uh, we'll spend some time uh, together in concentrated prayer over this next phase for us in the search process for a new senior pastor. Um, let's take the, up this morning's offering this morning um, together. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to extend generosity back to our generous God and, and show our worship and love to Him through what small parts of what He has given to us. And um, Today is also a family worship Sunday, and we have kids in our sanctuary and in our service this morning, and so this is a good opportunity for our families to, to help teach good habits and patterns of giving back to the Lord each and every week, and, um, and so let's do that as we pray together. Lord, we come together as a family, and we worship you, and we praise you, and we give to you, and... We recognize that you are worthy of our praise. You're worthy of, of all of it. And so, God, we, we take this moment uh, to, to give all that we have, our hearts, our lives, and, and an extension of what you have given to us um, as we worship you. So, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this church we thank you for the calling that you've placed upon us and the mission that you have set out before us. And God, we trust you as we take steps of faith each and every day to follow and obey and to love you more deeply. In Jesus' name, amen.
Throughout the summer months, we've been hearing from God's people, uh, their testimonies, and this morning, we asked uh, Jessica Gomez to come up. First time I heard Jessica Gomez was singing in Women's Life on Thursday morning in Praise Team. I'm like, who is this great singer? Well, I need to get to know her and get her in choir. So, Jessica, come and share with us. Hi, I'm Jessica Gombas. I'm kind of short. Okay. I've known about Jesus since before I can remember. Growing up in a church-growing family made that pretty easy. I went to Christian college and continued to attend church as a young adult. But my faith and knowledge about Jesus was very mixed with our culture as well as my thoughts and my opinions. However, in my mid-30s, that started to change. The most dramatic event happened on my 33rd birthday. I got a call from my manager at work. Maybe I was expecting birthday wishes or a Friday check-in call, but his tone was strange when the call began. I don't think my brain was registering what was happening until he said, your position has been eliminated, effective immediately. What? I thought I was good at my job. My little family needed my income. Plus, I had been taught that my value and worth depended on being productive, dependable, intelligent, and hardworking. Was I none of those things? Wasn't I good enough to keep around? Who was I if I wasn't those things? In the following days, I started getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to have some quiet time to get my head right before my babies woke up. At first, I thought I needed to do to meditate. So I did one of those 30-day meditation challenges. That didn't help. Then I decided to do yoga. Nope. Finally, God pressed it upon my heart to open up my Bible and to pray. And that's when I began to meet Jesus. Who I encountered was not the Jesus I had constructed in my head with major social and cultural influences, but the Jesus I found on the pages of the Bible. I didn't always like what I was reading, but I couldn't stop. During that time, I was really questioning my identity, struggling to care for, to find care for my children, deal with unemployment or part-time jobs, financial stresses, and marital conflict. Over and over during that time, I would find comfort reading the beginning of James. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. I remember thinking so many times, but I don't know what to do. And then I'd keep reading from James. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But then the tricky part was this. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Boy, that was an accurate description of me at the time. Blown and tossed by the wind, double-minded and unstable in all they do. I knew I had to ask Jesus what to do, and I had to believe and trust that it would be given to me. The next year, as a New Year activity, the pastor at our church at the time encouraged us to pray about picking a word for the new year. So I did, and much to my chagrin, Jesus pressed upon my heart the word, obey. What? This was not the Jesus I had constructed in my head who wanted me to follow my heart and live my truth. Guys, I know you're shaking your head at me, but at the time, I had a bookshelf full of self-help books, New Age yoga quotes on my mirror, and I followed all the self-help women empowerment influencers on Instagram. You get the picture. Now, here I am being told by this still, small voice that I need to obey. I knew it was God because I would never have come up with that word on my own. But my Bible reading had shown me over and over again examples of obedience or what happens when we don't obey God's word, and Jesus' example of obedience even to death. And so I began to try to live my life that way. Five years later, when COVID shut the world down, I was halfway through my first year in grad school. I thought maybe I should be a school psychologist. At the time, I had two kids in elementary school and one in daycare. I would never wish for that time period again, but God answered my prayers. 
God shut a lot of doors at that time, but he also opened new ones. And he provided for us beyond what I could have ever asked for. Who was going to take care of my kids? The answer was me. What was my job supposed to be? Teach them. Would we make it financially? We did. And as time passed by, the word obey, which I hated so much, has turned into trust and obey. And then I sing the little song to myself, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. So that's it. Since I met Jesus, he has changed my life dramatically, and he has changed my mind dramatically, and I expect that he probably still has a lot of work to do. Thanks. Let's stand as we continue in worship. Thank you, Jessica, for sharing.
God calling, not the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling, not the God of David, who made a shepherd boy great. Not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faith. Children, then you hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You read some prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are providing then. You are providing. At this time, we'd like to dismiss all the children up to grades five to go to children's ministry. They'll meet you out in the foyer uh, to meet with your children's leaders. And Pastor Don, come on up. Good morning, family. Good to see you here. We are glad to be together. I love the testimony times. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was just wonderful. We were gone for family vacation up in Wisconsin, and there was one thing I really missed out on, actually two. Missed out on hearing Joel preach, and Charlie sharing his testimony last week. When we heard it on the, listened to it later, both of us looked at each other and said, yes, Charlie, way to go. I just love our high school kids getting involved and sharing what God is doing in their lives. And we are here this morning asking for God to continue to speak to our hearts. Let's open a word of prayer this morning. Father, we come to you with so many different needs. Some of us are hurting this morning for a variety of different things going on in our lives. This morning, we want to sit at your feet. We want to hear your spirit speak to us. Some of us came this morning without any real expectations, just another Sunday. But Lord, would you wake us up? Would your word come with power? Would it transform, renew, 
Lord, for someone who's here today who does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray that this is their day of birth into your family. I pray that they will not be able to resist what you had to say to them as you reveal to them their need of Jesus Christ as their Savior. So we ask you to speak to our hearts, minister to us, each in the place of our need. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. There's a deliberate worldwide effort, a marketing machine that is, spends over $450 billion a year to make you and I discontent with life. It's really true. $450 billion to help you be unhappy with who you are, what you have, how you look, what you do. Advertising companies capitalize on covetousness. Well, that's not a word we use very often, is it? But advertising companies focus in on this. Social historians noted a change in America after the First World War. After the First World War, they were no longer uh, advertising companies and so forth, no longer conveying product information, which is what they did before. Now they were manufacturing desire. They were trying to help us understand why what we had was not good enough, why we should not be satisfied with what we had, why we needed more to truly be satisfied. They were creating needs. You want to know how serious and how openly they did this? Here's some instructions to those who want to go into sales. How to motivate your prospects was the title. As an advertiser, it is your job to create discontent inside the psyche of your prospects and make them desire the change that you are offering. We have people in Madison Avenue in New York making seven-figure salaries, trying to figure out how to make sure that you want more, that you don't have enough, that it's impossible for you to be content, satisfied, fulfilled, that it's impossible for you to be respected by others around you unless you have more of this or this or this or this. This issue of covetousness is very much a part of life in America still today. So let's take a look this morning at what the Bible talks about. What, what does it really mean when it says we are not to covet? Our study of the Ten Commandments has brought us to the final and tenth of the Ten Commandments. The other commandments are dealing with action. Do not steal, do not lie, do not murder, and so forth. But this one deals with attitude. The others have to do with behavior. This one has to do with where we allow our minds to go. The warning from Scripture is don't get caught in this trap. You start down this road, you will be down a road that will never satisfy. You will go down a road that will continue to place you in a place of discontent. So let's take the time to read this 10th commandment in Exodus 20, beginning with verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Notice the three different times in this 10th commandment Remember, written by the very finger of God himself. Three different times neighbor is mentioned. Three different times it says you make sure that you understand the relationship God wants you to have with others, with those who are neighbors in your life. He does not want you to spend your time envious of them he wants you to celebrate what God has given to you. Do not get caught in this envious life. He says, just in case we had a hard time understanding what this whole idea of uh, coveting is all about, 
he gives to us very specific instructions. He says, here's the things I'm talking about. He says, don't even think about touching your neighbor's wife in any way. His employee or his cattle or his house or his cars or his Rolex or anything that is his. Don't allow yourself to go there. It belongs to your neighbor. Some, some authors, as I was studying for this, said this. Coveting is the mother of all sins. If you allow yourself to go down the track of coveting, you will very quickly find yourself violating all of the other nine commandments. There's several illustrations of Scripture where it's just so clear as you work your way through. You start down that path and you justify coveting. You think it's an okay thing. And it's a hidden sin. It's one of those things that others can't see you doing necessarily. But as God speaks to us as his children, if you push it aside and said, God, this is no big deal. I'm okay. You're on the road for trouble. The 10th commandment gives an explanation to why we find ourselves breaking the other commandments so often. An interesting story I came across this week from Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was out walking his two little sons, and they were both crying. And as they were walking, somebody walked up to the president at the time and said, what's wrong with the boys? How come they're so unhappy? And he said, what's wrong with them is what's wrong with the world. He said, I have three walnuts. Each of them want two. <laughs> as I read that, I thought, uh-huh. Isn't that so typical of how, how life still is? The Hebrew word for coveting does not is not just to admire or wish to have something. The Hebrew word says to lay plans to take. Covetousness has been with us right from the very, very beginning. In Genesis 2.9, it tells us about God providing a beautiful garden, a unbelievably beautiful place for Adam and Eve right from the start. And let me just read for you again here in, in uh, Genesis 2, verse 9. The Lord made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So this was a beautiful garden. It had abundance. It was beautiful. It was not sin-stained. Everything there was exactly like God had created it to be. Perfect, unbelievable beauty for Adam and Eve. But he said, there's one tree that you're not allowed to touch. Actually, he didn't say you can't touch it. He said you can't eat of it. There's one tree that's forbidden to you. Everything else is yours. Enjoy to its fullest. It's beautiful. It's tasty. It's delightful. But look with me here in, in uh, chapter 3, verse, beginning with verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. <laughs> You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Desirable, good to eat, pleasing to the eye. There's nothing wrong with, wrong with me looking at it. There's nothing wrong with me enjoying what's here. I know it's forbidden, but I just want to dwell here just a little bit longer. Next time you take your turn in the nursery, oh, there's a great idea, huh? Getting signed up for the nursery. 
Uh, great place to minister. But next time you take your turn in the nursery, watch these little precious ones. Not even able to stand up yet. They're just sitting there, crawling around. And all of a sudden, a toy that was of no interest before <laughs> is in the hands of someone else. And all of a sudden, these pure, precious little ones, we discover that their parents have been teaching them things that we don't understand. How is it possible that all of a sudden these little ones want the toy that this other one has? They start coveting, and before you know it, instantaneously they're over there stealing it from them. A silly illustration, right? But who of us haven't seen it? We've watched it many times. It's the heart. It's what we come with, with the sin nature. Covetousness is part of our lives from the very beginning. I love what Paul says in Romans 7. Paul said that as he studied the commandments, and here's how I picture it. As he reads through the commandments, Paul says, well, I did that. <laughs> I did that one. I, I, you know, he, he works his way through and he's abiding by the Ten Commandments. And he's probably given himself real credit for that. But here in Romans 7, just verses 7 and 8 for the sake of time today, let me just read these two. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not cover it. But sin, seizing the opportunity, afforded me the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. What Paul is saying that as he understood and allowed God to teach him about coveting, he started seeing his heart. He started understanding what this was all about and how guilty he was. And why God puts this as a 10th commandment. Because if we start our, allow ourselves to start down that path of coveting, we will soon be in trouble no matter who we are. Paul loved Timothy, this young pastor, struggling through life, some physical issues that he had. And so Paul just lovingly continued to encourage and challenge Timothy to look to the Lord Jesus Christ for his strength, to, to continue on in growing in his grace and ministering to the people that he was with. And here in 1 Timothy, let me just read that for you. 1 Timothy 6, beginning with verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I wanted to specifically emphasize verse 9 this morning. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. If you're following along in the notes there, the second point is the source of covetousness. What is the source of covetousness? Jesus left absolutely no doubt at all what the source was. He said, it is your hearts. It is your belief in a lie. The belief that possessions and things are going to fulfill, bring you fulfillment in life. Over and over again, Jesus says, absolutely not. But we in America, many of us have bought into this in a lot of different ways. Some, some people you see just going headlong down that path. But for others, it's there, but we're not admitting it. It's there, and we're comfortable with it. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. 
wrote the, this when he first wrote the Declaration of Independence. Ramon man has the inalienable right to life, liberty, and possessions. And a committee later changed that to life, liberty, and happiness. But in many people's definition, what does happiness mean? Happiness means the possessions I have. So for those who believe that happiness is going to come from possessions that you have, Jesus says, no, it doesn't. And if in your mind you find yourself saying, yes, but, then I have some cautions for you. I have some challenges for you from God's word itself. That thinking will lead you into trouble. God says that we are to have, be on guard for every kind of greed. We are to be careful when covetousness steps in. Because once we start down that path, we are on the path of discontent, frustration, unhappiness, unfulfillment. We are on a path to endless despair because no matter how hard we work towards getting those things and allowing those things to be part of our life, they will never mount up to what we think they're going to bring to us. Listen to what Jesus said in Mark 7. Here in Mark 7, begin with verse 21. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. A sad illustration of this, where we just watch a great man fall down flat on his face, is the story of King David. King David, who had great wealth, King David, who had great respect from the, the countries around him, King David, whose people loved him as a whole. King David, who was supposed to be with his armies on a battlefield, but decided that he would stay at home. And one night, going up on the palace roof, he observes a woman bathing in the evening. And this man of vast riches sees her and wants her. He saw her, he wanted her, he sent for her, he committed adultery with her. He tried to cover up his sin. And eventually, because Bathsheba's husband Uriah was an honorable man, the only way he thought he could get rid of this was to kill Uriah. As I was reading this account again, one that I've been read many, many times over the years, there's something I had never seen before that stood out to me. And it's here in the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel, verse 25. As David is talking to the head of the army, we see the hardness of his heart. Because David has put this, Joel, uh, the head of the army, into a very bad situation. And he tells his uh, Joab, he says, here's the message I want you, the messenger, give to Joab. Say this to Joab. Don't let this upset you, the death of Uriah. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. That is a complete lie. That man was murdered by David. And Joel went along with it. Joab went along with it. David was guilty. And David's heart was hard. 
And as we know the history of David, he paid a terrible price for this as the days went on with his family. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. During my junior and senior year in high school, I had the use of a car, a Plymouth Valiant. You guys know what a luxury liner that was. <laughs> I looked at most of my friends who were driving much nicer cars, and I can remember wishing I had their car. So I drove that, that car my junior and my senior year, and after my senior year in high school, my family went back to Europe. We had three trumpets, two piano players, all of us kids sang together, played our instruments together, we were involved in evangelistic meetings. And one of the places we went was Finland, which was where we had ministered as missionaries for some evangelistic meetings. And while we were there, one of the early converts of my parents' ministry, uh, who had now was a very successful businessman there in Tampere, which is the second largest city in Finland, lent us his car to use. Now, I, w I had my license, so he was fine with me driving it around. I found myself really enjoying driving this car because not too many American cars were around there and people noticed it. And some of the kids who were my age came over and wanted to see it because it had automatic transmission and most of the cars over there didn't have automatic transmission. So I really enjoyed driving this car around. It was a Plymouth Valiant. And it wasn't until I got home and got into our Plymouth Valiant that I realized what God had in mind for me. He rebuked me. He showed the condition of my heart. I enjoyed driving that car among people who had less. I did not enjoy driving that car among people who had more. My heart was exposed. It was a lesson that impacted me all the way through my college years. Just remember. Remember how easy it is to slip into this kind of thinking. And remember the destructive power it has. It destroyed David. Now let me make sure that we understand something here. Temptation and desire are two different things. Temptation comes into our life, and we can't stop it unless we're walking ourselves into some place where temptation is. But life is full of temptation. So temptation is not the problem. Temptation is when we go to the next step and allow coveting to become a part. So temptation is the door. Coveting is when we open the door and we look inside and say, I wonder what the temptation's all about. I just want to look at it. I'm not going to have any part in it. And God says, uh-uh. Coveting will destroy you. And he's warning us here in this 10th commandment, do not allow yourself to start looking with envy at what others have. It'll trap you and eventually destroy you. So what is the answer to coveting? What does God want our response to be to coveting? That's the third point here, the solution to coveting. The solution to coveting is learning to be content with what I have now. It's a change of thinking it's reorienting our mind. It's not allowing the advertising around us to trap us. In fact, it's allowing us to get to the place where we say, ha, I got you on that one. I know exactly where you're leading. I know exactly what you're trying to say, and I don't buy it. When you and I can get to that place, 
where we can actually thank the Lord and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for protecting me from that kind of life. Thank you for protecting me from thinking that way. Thank you for reminding me that I cannot go inside that door and look around. That's the coveting that leads to the sin. That's the coveting that will trap me. That's the coveting that will never allow me to be satisfied. God wants us to simply recognize the coveting at the very heart of it is simply an ungrateful heart. An ungrateful heart. Turn with me, if you would, to Philippians 4. And I'd love to encourage you to bring your Bibles. Don't just rely on what's up on the screen. And here's why. I can't tell you how many times as I've listened to others preach and I've turned to the passage in Scripture, God has something special for me. Maybe the verses next or the verses before are just an extra, cost, uh, extra delay in sinking in and drawing back those Scriptures after they're long gone from the screen. I want to encourage you, bring your Bibles. Allow God to use His Word to minister to you. Here in Philippians 4, beginning with verse 10. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in what. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I am learning to be content. I have learned to be content, Paul says, in what I have not allowing what I don't have to bring the discontent. In 1990, a young man up in Canada, uh, Ottawa, Canada, robbed a bank of $6,000. After getting caught, he was, went to trial and was given a six-year sentence in jail for his crime. But here's what's fascinating about this. The gun he used to rob the bank was a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol made by a company called Ross Rifle. It was made in 1918. The young man, if I rem remind you, robbed the bank of $6,000. The gun he used was worth 100000 Why did I bring that up today? Because sometimes, because we refuse to see what God has already given us, we make really foolish decisions. And we don't value what God has already blessed us with. And we're robbed of the joy of his blessings in our lives. So the first thing, first way for us to get rid of and overcome covetousness is this grateful heart. But there's one other important one. And this one is a gracious heart. A grateful heart and a gracious heart. God wants us to recognize that what he has given to us many times is not intended solely for us. What he's given to us was also intended for us to share with others. There's always, remember Christ says, there's always going to be the poor. There's always going to be the needy. There's always going to be friends who could word, use a word of encouragement, who could use an invitation to your home for a meal. There's always going to be others whose needs you can meet, and God has provided you with the means to meet their needs. But covetousness causes us to just hang on. I need more in my bank account. I need more in my investments. I need more in this and this and this and this. And God says, I didn't give that to you just to sit on it. 
I gave that to you to be used for your blessing and the blessing of others. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Who's going to refresh them? God is saying, I will refresh them. If you're willing to refresh others, I will refresh them. No, they're not in poverty. No, they're not wondering for where their next meal is. But you have the means to bless them in some way. He's, God says, I will supply for you. Refresh them. I'll refresh you. In Acts 20, verses 33 through 35, we read this. I have not coveted anything, anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have applied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So the root of coveting is not what I can get. The root of coveting, getting over coveting, is what I can give. The last passage I'd like to look at this morning is 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, beginning with verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Ah, oh, Half of us get off here. We don't have to worry about this. We're not rich, right? <laughs> Compared to the rest of the world, we're all rich. We're all rich. So let me read that again. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. God doesn't just leave us here with no answers. In fact, he gives us insights into the real secrets of life. Don't get caught in this trap of covetousness. Don't allow it to sit in your mind. Don't allow yourself to open the door and look inside and just sort of graze at this stuff. It'll trap you. It'll pull you in. He's saying, be someone who has a gracious, thankful heart, willing to share, willing to impact the world with God, what God has already given you. There's a little chorus that I'd like to end with. If you know it, just join me with you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Stand closer service.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless. Mm -hmm.